So the topic that I'm going to be talking about today is the remission of type 2 diabetes, which is the new kid on the block. But the difference between earlier and this study is this is going to be done at a population level. And I'm going to be talking about the role Please of diet in the ICMR in diet study. This is a manuscript that has just gotten accepted in diabetes care for publication just last week. And I have no conflict of interest to declare. So let's talk about the natural history of diabetes. So we all know that people go from NGT to pre-diabetes, to clinical diabetes, and the stage of complications. And thus far, the goal of all diabetes treatment has been in prevention. So it could have been primary prevention or secondary prevention, depending as the case may be. But today, we're talking about a new concept, which is actually remission or going backwards in time. Thus far, there have been a lot of studies done on remission at the individual level. So what are they trying to do? For someone who's got diabetes, they can go all the way to pre-diabetes or maybe, maybe even to NGT. Now, what's the definition of reversal or remission? Let's stick with the ADA definition, which talks about remission being an A1C of less than 6.5% for a period of at least three months without diabetes medication. So that is uh, the definition we'll use and the official terminology is going to be remission of diabetes. Now, what's the evidence we have for remission? The first remission was shown by Roy Taylor's group in the counterpoint study. So what they did here is they took 11 people with type 2 diabetes, most of them were male, and put them on a 600 kilocalorie diet. Now, just to put this into perspective, the average Indian eats anything between two, two, five, three thousand calories a day, depending on type of behavior and things like that. But uh, from there, if someone has diabetes, we generally talk about a thousand four hundred, a thousand two hundred kilocalorie diet. Now, from there, we're talking about six hundred kilocalories. This is very, very low calorie diet. And this was for a period of eight weeks. The diet was in liquid form. So it was a liquid meal replacement with about 46% carbs. So this is what they did. And they looked at uh, the hepatic glucose output, hepatic and peripheral insulin sensitivity, and beta cell function, along with pancreatic and liver triazole glycerol content. And this was matched with controls. So this is what happened. If you look at the fasting plasma glucose in those in the intervention group, you can see in yellow, it came zooming down even the first week. So what this says is that if you go into this liquid meal replacement in seven days, your blood glucose normalizes to almost equivalent of control. These are normals. They're non-diabetic controls in the red. So you can see almost equivalent to that level. You're able to bring the glucose levels and it stays there for that period of eight weeks. Now let's look at the liver fat and pancreatic fat takes a little longer something to about two weeks ish to come down control is again the red line and then if you continue with this diet the fat goes down to even lower than normal levels both in the liver and the pancreas now what about insulin sensitivity goes up considerably in the first week itself as the glucose comes down insulin sensitivity peaks and continues to peak uh, for the eight week period and similarly the phosphate c peptide secretion also improves uh, quite well so this was the first study on remission showing that it was actually possible with metabolic benefits then the same group went on to do the counterbalance study where they took a larger number of individuals and divided them into two groups so one is the diabetes with less duration so that's less than four years and then they had people with more than eight years duration they did the same thing they gave them the liquid calorie diet for eight weeks and then they moved them on to solid diet for a period of six months but please note here that even the solid diet was only at the 600 kilocalorie level so this is what the counterbalance did and here's what they showed so in the first column here so the green is all the short duration diabetes and the pink is the long duration diabetes irrespective of duration there was a fantastic weight loss as shown in the first uh, column here. So with uh, over the eight week period, there was a beautiful linear decrease in weight and it stayed down. Now what happened to fasting plasma glucose? Now this had two different uh, kind of behaviors. The first one is for those with short duration. Everyone with short duration diabetes, glucose came down, stayed down. 
Now, for those with longer duration diabetes, there are three types of people as indicated by the yellow dotted line. So the first group are those who responded, the responders, sugar came down, stayed down, just like this short duration. Then there was a group for whom the sugars came down, but gradually, you didn't see the dramatic effects of the responders, they were kind of slow responders. And then you had this group of people, irrespective of weight loss, and this was a very impressive, almost 15 kilogram weight loss, their blood glucose did not come down, and these people were termed the non-responders. We then went, uh, went on to this study, which is the direct study done in the US. They had about 200, 300 people in their study, intervention and control from all over the US, and they had two year follow up for the participants. What did they show here? So in year one versus year two, the first thing that they showed is the number of people achieving that 15 kilo weight loss. So in the control group, obviously nobody, hardly anybody achieved. In the intervention group, 24% of people achieved the weight loss in year one, but then it went down to half that in year two. So the number of people who actually attained the weight loss came down over time. What about remission? Again, here, less than 50% control, almost no one. Now, in the intervention group, almost 45.6% of people attained remission as defined by the ADA. But this went down to about 35% in year two. But the famous point that they made here is the panel below, which talks about the degree of remission based on weight loss. With less than five kilo weight loss, there was hardly any remission, five to 10 more. And as you go more than 15 kilos, the remission becomes impressive. So here the points they made were as follows, that the remission is directly related to the weight loss, more weight loss, more remission, but remission is not for everybody. Some people respond, some people don't respond. So that is what the director. So what is the evidence we have so far? At individual remission uh, level, remission is possible. We do not have data beyond two years. However, then in a place like India, cultural factors and the diversity of the society that we have hampers our ability to give liquid diet. So all the trials I showed so far, everybody has been on a 600, 800 liquid diet for a period of three months. Now, if you talk to the general population of India and ask them to take liquid for 800, there's hardly going to be any takers for such a thing. So although it works, this practicality and uh, the ethnic diversity that we have precludes the use of something like this for everybody at a large scale whereas India has a large scale diabetes problem so we do need a solution that can be done uh, in the general population and that was the genesis of this paper in which, which we asked the question in India can we look at population level macronutrient changes for prevention of chronic diseases like diabetes. So we first went to official surveys that were there, the NSSO, the NNMB, NFHS, and we didn't really find any answers to these. So we then went on to the ICMR, India Diabetes Study, or INDIAB for short. Now, what is this? This is a study funded by the Indian Council of Medical Research and the Department of Health Research Government of India, which looks at not only diabetes, but all of metabolic and CDs in every single state in the country. So what did the study aim to do? It aimed to provide optimal macronutrient recommendations for remission and prevention of type 2 diabetes using optimization models in the Asian Indian adult population at the population level. And this is what the study is about. So in Diab, has data from all the 30 states and union territories so that's about one lakhish population but in every fifth participant we had detailed dietary data so we had a dietary in about 20,000 individuals with a response rate about 92 percent after removing those with known diabetes and outliers dietary data of about 19,000 individuals were analyzed if you look at this it, there was a 70 percent rural um, distribution very similar so this sits exactly on the census data because it's been modeled on that and then you have an equal kind of sex distribution between men and women.
Now, what exactly was done? So we took all of the entire dietary data. The first thing we did is we took, we did a linear regression. The equation is shown there where X are the non-dietary factors and Z is the dietary factor. So what did we do? We tried to first define this in three different categories. We used the regression to see which were the factors associated with A1C. Then we started doing stratification. So we needed by three categories. So we have newly detected diabetes, pre-diabetes and normal glucose tolerance. Now, what are we doing in each of these categories? For those with newly detected diabetes, we're trying to push to remission. That means less than 6.5%. For those with pre-diabetes, push to NGT, remission. That is less than 5.6%. So in two categories, NDD and PD, we're looking at remission uh, as defined by the 6.5 and 5.6. Now there's two other categories, which is the prevention of progression. So in NGT, we're looking at prevention of progression to diabetes and in pre-diabetes also, we're looking at prevention of progression. So these were the glycemic, four glycemic categories were there. And we looked at remission and prevention. So this was also stratified by urban rural areas, sex, physical activity, BMI, and age. So the objective of what we call the quadratic programming problem was as follows. It asked the question, what degree of macronutrient distribution? So what they did is they took all the X's or the non-dietary factors and fixed these. And only the, the Z was allowed to change. So what combination of macronutrients pushed the majority of the population to less than 6.5 if it's a newly detected or if it's to less than 5.6 if it's a pre-diabetic. So this is how they did it or what percentage of what combination of macronutrients prevented progression. So in these four categories, this is how we came out with the macronutrient recommendations. So what are these recommendations? So given the first column are the current population intakes of carbohydrates about 62% urban rural all across protein is 12 fat is 25 and fiber is 3.5%. So in order to get about 78 to 80% remission in those with NDD and PD, what do we have to do to the macronutrients? If the carbohydrate percentage has to be between 49 and 54, so around 55, 50% of carbohydrates. So 62 has to go to 50. Now, this doesn't sound like a very big difference, but in real life, when you're actually asking someone to do this, this can be a huge change that you're asking of them. So move the carbohydrate down to 50% in those with NDD. Protein has to move from 12 to about 20%. Fat is okay where it is at the moment and fiber has to increase from 3.5 to about 6%. So this is the kind of macronutrient uh, recommendation for NDD. For those with PDD for remission, we can allow to about 55%, so 5% higher in those with PD is allowed for carbohydrate, protein again 20, fat little more is allowed, fiber is about the same. So this will help to push about 80% of the population into remission. Now, do we have differences by substratification in urban and rural areas? Yes, there are small differences. For example, the rural areas can consume a little bit more carbohydrate and uh, uh, fiber. Whereas the fat intake has to be lower, protein is about the same. So again, it's about the same. There are only 1%, 2% differences here and there. Rural areas, little bit more we allow in the cup. Now, what about activity? Again, common sense tells you that if you're slightly more active, you can take more carb. And thus you'll see, for those who are really physically active, up to 58% carb is allowed because you're burning it off uh, quite easily. The rest are about the same protein, fat and all are about the same and fiber. But uh, for those who are inactive, carb comes all the way down to about 50%. Men and women, again, uh, men are allowed a little more carbohydrate because of more metabolism in the men, uh, whereas the rest is the, uh, essentially the same. The young and the elderly, obviously elderly, everything comes down. So men, uh, uh, sorry, uh, younger people are allowed slightly more carbohydrate, not by much, but a little bit more. Others are the same. So even if you look at the various categorization, you will see similar things. Similarly for BMI, those who are uh, not overweight or obese, can take a little more carb than the rest. So if you look across, it seems that the recommendations are stable across categories of substratification 
and overall small changes depending on activity and uh, BMI and things can be made. Now, what about for uh, pre-diabetes remission? So we talked about 55% being overall. Same rules apply here. Little more allowed in urban areas. Little more allowed in active individuals. Uh, little more allowed in men and in younger people. Similarly, it's all very small little changes. 1% here and there. It's similar very much to the NDD. And similarly, overweight and obese have to be more careful. So this is the overall story that we are saying for remission of diabetes and pre-diabetes. Now, what about prevention of progression? So these are the plates given here. The one on the left is for pre-diabetes and the one on the right is for uh, NGT. So in an NGT individual, actually up to 60% carbohydrate can be allowed. Protein 70, fats 24 and fiber. So what have they done here is that they've taken up the protein and the fiber, leaving carb where it is. Because these are NGT individuals, right? So if you can actually increase the activity, the protein and the fiber, uh, you may have, we have some evidence to show that there's prevention of progression. Those with pre-diabetes, uh, this comes down and the carbohydrate is at between 54, 58. They have to be more careful. Protein definitely goes up. Fiber goes up. Uh, and the fat, you have to be careful, especially if they're overweight or obese. So these are the recommendations that we have. I'd like to conclude by saying that for the first time, we have looked at a population-based approach for remission and prevention of progression of type 2 diabetes by reorganization, uh, reorganizing macronutrient composition. We are advising an overall carb calorie reduction and increase in protein calorie with increase in fiber. So to prevent progression also we're talking about protein increase and fiber increase those who are physically inactive obese and older and as well as those in urban areas require greater reduction in the carb and greater increase in their protein intake so i would like to conclude and thank uh, once again for giving me this opportunity to present to you today thank you